him that he got into the boat and sat on it while all the people stood on shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. It sprang up quickly because the soil, soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered and became because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what it was sown. He, and this is a key verse that we'll look at, he who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the kingdom, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They can hardly hear with their ears, and they have their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and in turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, but blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but do not see it, and to hear what you hear, but do not hear it. Verse 18 says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who receives the seed that fell am among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Ushers, if you come forward, we'll pray for the morning's offering. We'll pray over this scripture well over our message Let's bow our heads Heavenly Father we just thank you for this day that you give us each day that we are on this planet earth and given the opportunity to serve you to hear your word to sing your praises is a good day um, they may not always feel like that but it's a good day to be in the Lord and Father I, I just pray this morning as we look at these scriptures Father that um, you would help us to uh, understand what the word is teaching us through these parables. Understand what, why Jesus, today we look at why Jesus used parables, why he spoke in this way to the peoples that he was with at the time he walked this earth, why these um, parables are still a, a, a prominent way of communication throughout the word of God as you use them to teach us, and uh, why they're so powerful and why they have this uh, life-changing effect upon them when they're heard and they're understood. Lord, I pray for um, our junior church. Father, I pray for uh, that's going to be taking place. I pray for our offering this morning. I just pray that you would bless uh, the gift and the giver. Lord, those who are obedient uh, and tithe, Father, so that uh, you would tithe, so that we can continue to do ministry this, uh, in this place, in this community, to reach lost souls for you. Father, just bless our time together now, I pray, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. Kids can be dismissed to junior church.
This morning, it's kind of, I read, as I said, we have a, there's a lot of scripture right there. And I left the parable of the sower in there. It's one of my favorite parables. But I left the beginning and the end of that passage. And really what I want to look at this morning is the middle part of it. Uh, before we embark upon these, uh, it's not really a ser sermon series. I just like to, um, I've got to where I like to preach things about things in a while. I think we better, um, I feel better equipped. I don't know, it's just what the Lord's been doing in my heart. But we're kind of looking at um, the, from verse 9 until uh, verse 16 this morning is what we're truly kind of looking at. And we're looking at um, uh, these stories. Uh, and then next week we'll begin to, to actually look at the stories themselves and, and begin to decipher them. Uh, the parable of the sower, as I said, is uh, he gives it in the beginning of this um, uh, section of scripture and then his uh, disciples come to him and they ask why, why do you speak to the people in parables and uh, then he begins to reveal why he does this and then at the end of it he gives the meaning to the parable of the sower uh, to the disciples And um, but this morning the first question I felt on my heart for us is um, what is a parable so that we understand why one of the most probably maybe the most prolific question that i get asked of me um is pastor how do i know when the holy spirit is speaking to me how do i know when when it's coming from the bible that's a hard one to explain many times because i can speak to us in many ways many shapes many forms um I've seen messages on a billboard, and that was the answer that I needed as I'm going down the highway. Uh, I will tell you, the, I think the most prolific way that God speaks to us is through the Bible, through the Word of God. And we have to understand it. We have to know what he's talking about so that we can get um, the best wealth of knowledge, um, inspiration, if you will, spiritual understanding. Um, he also speaks to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the questions. How do I know when the Holy Spirit? I tell people the Holy Spirit is like a conscience that's better than your conscience. Amen. It's like when we get saved and we accept Christ, and even before that, because the Holy Spirit draws us. But um, it's this is how I explained it early on when I. When I got saved, I didn't know anything about God. I think I'm going in and out. Yes, maybe. The uh, my batteries get wore out, and so does my mic. The um, we we understand uh, as we get to know Him. Um, one of the greatest assets to understanding knowing when God is speaking to us is you have to know him you have to know what he talks about you have to know who he is you have to desire it and um, many times uh, I don't think we desire it as much as we should to hear from God to to, to walk with him part of it and I, I, I don't want to be mean this morning part of it's just the fact that we're mature as Christians when we begin to walk with him it just takes time to, to get to know God um, and, and get to uh, understand when he's speaking to you Jesus taught, there was many parables uh, in the word. A, a parable is a story that Jesus used to, um, well, I don't want to share that part yet. Let me go back first. Parables, number one, parables were not invented by Jesus. I had never thought about this before because I thought that Jesus kind of invented these things because you see it in there. As I was studying, I was watching uh, um, Dr. R.C. Sproul, he's, a, he's an old dude who knows a lot of wisdom about the Bible, um, teaches it. One of the things I happened to come across on parables, I was listening to him and studying. He, there's all types of writings that he has put out there. And uh, I didn't really realize, I've always, like I said, I thought that um, Christ had kind of invented the parable. And this is the way he talked and the way he taught. In truth, when you find out, when you think about it, there are 
um, parables in the Old Testament where God uses um, a story, so to speak, to uh, make an illustration. Sometimes he uses it to bring judgment, to indicate judgment. Uh, sometimes, as we'll get to it, uh, Jesus with his parables most generally was um, bringing a new revelation to us, teaching us something that we didn't need to explain, and it wasn't just an, an illustration, but it was unlocking the secrets to the kingdom of heaven that we, we talk about, that the disciples talk about here. Um, I want to share with you one of the most notable uh, parables in the Old Testament is, uh, are we familiar with Dave and Bathsheba, King David and Bathsheba? He was on the, the roof, and he seen Bathsheba in the tub, in the fountain bathing, and she was good to look at, and he decided he had to have her, and uh, so he takes her home, commits adultery, gets her pregnant. Uh, she's married to one of his top military uh, leaders in the Bible. Uh, when he realizes uh, that he wants to keep her and how deeply in, in sin he is, whether he, he sends Uriah, her husband, out to the battlefield, he instructs, uh, I can't remember, it might have been Nathan that he instructed to take, you know, let's move them all up to the front of the line where the fighting is the most fierce. When Uriah gets there, um, I should say, Uriah, when he come back into town, uh, David was trying to be very uh, pleasant to him and offer him all kinds of things. And Uriah was very loyal to David, very loyal to God. He wouldn't uh, accept any of the... Um, amenities that David had, he said, you know, far be it for me to come here and eat steak and, and lay around and, and rest while my men are out fighting this battle against the Amorites. And uh, David couldn't, because uh, what David wanted him to do was come home and lay with his wife, so then uh, he it wouldn't know that he, David, got her pregnant, but it would be Uriah, you know, uh, kind of like a soap opera that we, uh, back in Bible times. The uh, he didn't want to do that. He had too much uh, loyalty to his men. And, and so when that didn't work, David sent him back out to battle. And he told, I believe Nathan, he said, when they get to the front of the line and, and the, yeah, um, fighting is the fiercest, you should all fall away and leave Uriah there to be killed. So I don't think he ever told the person why that he was doing that, but that's what happened. Uriah was killed. Then he was able to take Bathsheba for his own. Where... Um, we come up to this prop, this parable that Nathan uses to illustrate to David the sin that he committed. Then the Lord sent, verse 12 of Second Samuel, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and he grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food, drunk, drank from his cup, and even sleeps in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Verse 4 says, Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. King David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I have anointed you king over Israel. I have delivered you from the hand of Saul. I have gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if this had not, if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. It goes on. David is convicted. He understands that through this parable, uh, he's able to see his own um, sin, his own guiltiness, his own guilt. Um, if you read on, what happens is uh, David... God spares David. He said, you're not going to die on account of your sin, but your first, the, the, the child that's within Bathsheba, that's your son, is going to get ill, and I'm going to take your child from you. And uh, David, what David does is he 
dresses himself with sackcloth. When, when there was, um, in the Old Testament, <coughs> excuse me, when they say sackcloth and ashes, they would put on basically like burlap. This was a, 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 um, how they mourned, how they were, it was shown that they mourned. And they would put ashes and dirt on their head, and that would be a sign of mourning. David laid out in sackcloth and ashes for a week. He fasted, wouldn't eat. He was praying for God to spare this child that he had created with Bathsheba. Uh, but the child got sick. The Lord took the child. And uh, meanwhile, while this was going on, his servants are talking to David. They're, they'd never seen him like this. He's not eating, he's not drinking. They fear for what's going on in him. And uh, it, the minute he gets word that his uh, uh, child is gone, he, he recovers himself and, and begins to go forward. And he says, uh, his servants were kind of surprised, you know, well, born before the child died. And he says, and not after, he said, now I know that the Lord, he has gone to be with the Lord, and he's no longer with me, so there's nothing else I can do. I will go to him, he says. So he knows, you know, because sometimes when we read this stuff, especially the Old Testament, it seems like God was pretty harsh, taking his own child. But God had pulled him away out of a, a um, an adulterous relationship I don't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you why God took the child and took him to heaven other than he wasn't going to allow David to have a, uh, uh, the firstborn with him, uh, with her, that one. That was his punishment. Um, but the child goes to heaven to be with God, so that's a good spot to end up. And he, David says, I will go to him someday. Uh, David does go ahead and, afterwards, and he takes Bathsheba as his wife, and uh, she gets pregnant again, and he has Solomon. They have Solomon, who we read about. But as you see, this parable in the Old Testament pointed out to David, um, it was Nathan went in there and said, hey, look, this is what's happening. This is what you've done. He let, in a manner of the way that they taught, they let, the parable would let David come to this realization of, of how bad and terrible this man is. And then he, the second thing, he would come to realization and realize, that man is me. And then he would, he, so... It wasn't a he say, she say. It was, it was a word from God that he got in his head. So I shared this with you because there's other parables in the Old Testament, but this is one of the most famous ones that we see in, in um, to the illustration that Jesus wasn't the one who invented parables. He probably was because he's God and he, he created everything together. But uh, the Pharisees actually used parables as well to illustrate the Mosaic law. They believed in the Leviticus, which uh, there's 638 laws that they followed in the Old Testament. To them, the law was God back in that day, and I'm sure to some orthodoxies it still is. But uh, the, the Pharisees would use the parables to explain or illustrate a written um, Mosaic law. Uh, so parables can also be used to illustrate uh, a point that they're trying to get across. Now we get to Jesus, and that's where I want to spend our time at in uh, these sermons. Jesus used these uses parables in both of these contexts. You will see it throughout uh, the New Testament. And um, I was going to take account of how many parables that were in the, the Bible, and I um, forgot to do that. To be honest with you, uh, from the Old Testament, yes, there's a lot of them in there uh, from uh, Christ. Um, he used them not only to pass, I shouldn't say pass judgment, but to judge the actions, to bring awareness to the fact, like Nathan did, awareness to the fact that you've done wrong. And you, I, I, I like the way that that happens because, it, like I say, it's not people pointing fingers at each other. It's God bringing to the revelation of what you've done. And you, you figure it out on your own and you become uh, personally responsible for it. He also uses them for uh, illustrations. It says in many of my notes here, it says, uh, uh, many of Jesus' parables began with phrases such as, the kingdom of God is, is like. He was often I illustrating, this is what it's like. Because we have to understand when Jesus showed up on earth incarnate as the Christ, you know, for 33 years he was here. He was a, a baby raised all the way up to the age of 30. Then he entered into his public ministry, and he was here to establish the kingdom of God among men. Not that God had done that in the Old Testament. God had established his holiness 
and his power and his righteousness. But now Jesus is saying, and when we look back at the Old Testament, when we realize the holiness and power of God and the way he did things, really without Jesus, there was no way to get into that kingdom because there's no way we can earn our way in to the, the power of God. So we had to have Jesus. So he's coming and he's turning upside down to some degree what these Pharisees are teaching it, it, because they're very um, keen to the, the, to the Levitical law. And to them, the law is God. It's not God's law. The law is God. And uh, so now he is uh, here, not only, as I said, in those first two contexts, but he is here, when he shares a parable, it gives us, he, most generally, he's unlocking a revelation to us. Something that we wouldn't understand on our own. Something that uh, it, it takes the Holy Spirit to teach us, but it also brings to life uh, this word that he's trying to teach us. I did want to back up and say, he's, in that revelation, he's also illustrating um, how the kingdom of God is. He's illustrating, you know, because many times we think of the kingdom of God as being heaven, which that's part of it. But the kingdom of God is alive and well here on earth. We are part of the kingdom of God in the spiritual aspect of it. And he's trying to uh, teach us how it should be, what we should be like, what we should do in, in all of these uh, different things. Um, but many times it's the revelation, and this is what I wanted to get to, uh, the part where he says here in the second point, if you would, Jesus or it says, for whom were the parables intended? These, these points kind of run together. For whom were the parables intended? Many times we see when we're dealing with the parables, Jesus will close or whoever's speaking that parable will close with it. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Sometimes we see he who has uh, eyes to see, let them see. As we're talking about this revelation and we transition into this next point, um, we're talking about he who has ears to let him hear. Let's read this, this passage that I have. It's a part, a sec, set middle section out of the passage that we're dealing with today. Mark 9. Should I use Mark 9 or Matthew? No, I used Matthew up there and Mark here. All right, I interchanged those. Mark chapter 4, verse 9. It says, Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He, re he replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Verse 15, for the people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal it. But blessed are you, because, but blessed are you, because they see in your ears, because they hear. Blessed are you, because they see, excuse me, blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. Um, i got to get in the right spot on my bifocals while I'm reading. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when we talk about let them hear, uh, sometimes, and as I was listening to Dr. Scro Sproul um, talk, he, he said, even this, he said, sometimes the word of God seems harsh. What he's talking about here when he says, give him ears to hear, let them have ears to hear. In, in, the point that I have made is who is the, the uh, parables for? The parables are for everybody, but only certain people are going to get them and understand them. And it, see, it seems as though that Jesus covers up their understanding. 
covers up their ability to see and hear by the things we read. Um, the case in point is the people that he's talking about here, those who will not hear and not see, are the people whose hearts are already set against the gospel. Now, I believe, and I say this often, that nobody will ever, judgment won't pass, Jesus won't show up here on earth and take the, the spirit out and the church out of, out of the earth, lest everyone's given an opportunity to receive Jesus. I don't believe in predestination. Um, I forget who I had a discussion about that with a while back. Um, just a couple months ago, we were discussing predestination. Uh, some uh, theologists think that Jesus has already preordained who gets saved and who doesn't. He doesn't do that. We're all given an opportunity. When we talk about predestination, or it, it, it's the way the, the, the Greek um, translates into the American English. Um, it's more of, instead of pre, predetermined, it's foreknowledge. God knows everything from beginning to end. It's not that he said, well, we're going to, I often see it like this. I think it back in grade school and uh, gym class when they said, all right, number off, one, two, four, one, you know, you're one, you're one, you're four. He doesn't do it like that, you know. All right, get up there. You're in heaven. You're not. You're not. You are. He, not, he doesn't do that. We all have this opportunity. But with his omnipotence and his, and his mindset, he knows who's going to make those decisions. He, you know, because I, I often hear about Pharaoh, well, it seems kind of mean that he would harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was never going to turn in the Old Testament. Pharaoh had become an, an example and an instrument of God because God knew he was, his heart was not going to turn back. So he hardened it, and he used Pharaoh to pour out these plagues on, to bring his people out as a foreshadow of what Christ would do. Moses is kind of a... Uh, Old Testament Christ, if you will, because he was leading uh, the, the Israelites out away from um, Pharaoh that was given his job. And uh, Pharaoh, God hardened his heart so he, that he could make an example out of Pharaoh, basically, in the Old Testament that we would see for all times. But he didn't harden it because he just decided, well, I don't like Pharaoh. and just he's, He doesn't get a chance. Pharaoh was given a chance, and God knew he was going to reject it. So Pharaoh became, even though he didn't get into heaven, uh, he became pretty popular in the Bible. People have been reading about him for 2,000 years. Um, when we think that, how God can be seemingly harsh, here he's talking about people who are not going to receive the Word of God. They're not going to see or listen through the eyes and ears of Christ. We see it all over the place. I was wondering how I was going to phrase this today, last night when I was speaking. Um, there's certain people that you can argue with in this day and age, and I am baffled sometimes when I argue. Liberal people, progressive liberal mindset, I, I get baffled sometimes when I argue with them. I try, I, I try not to argue. I try to discuss. Sometimes the discussions get intense, we'll say. But have you ever, it, it, there's some people that I, I just look at them when we're arguing or when I'm watching it on news and, and we're discussing things, they just cannot see the truth. It's just, they just can't understand things. And I'm not saying that I know everything or I'm not saying I know anything. I know the Word of God. I know what He teaches, what He preaches. I've been studying for 30 years to understand this. And I look at some people and I just think, how can you even think like that? Uh, you, we go along with some of this gender stuff. I, I've seen, uh, I'll probably get myself in trouble again, but the, uh, they were showing on the news uh, some clips from uh, teachers who were in favor of all this uh, uh, gender assignment stuff and, and talking about it to uh, um, K through third graders in light of the bill in Florida and, and some of the things. And uh, this one gentlemen on here that they're showing a clip of they're on tiktok they're outing some of these things people say he says he's explaining to his kindergarten class that when mommy and daddy have a baby the doctor takes it out and he takes a look at it he holds it up and he takes his best guess 
at whether this is a boy or a girl, because he doesn't really know how God has made him or what's really inside of this individual. Um, how do you argue with that? I mean, I argue with it, but you can't. I'm like, there, there are days when I, I see that or have that discussion with people, and I'm just, I don't even know what to say. You know how hard it is for me to get spellbound and not be able to speak? You just can't understand. There's sometimes when you see this, I'll tell you another one that I spotted this week. Because sometimes you might think, well, Pastor, you talk about this every week. Well, it keeps, it's growing every week. You need to hear about it. Keep it in the forefront. Little girl, Avery, the, the three-year-old granddaughter. She's about this tall now. I can go there. But, um, and her favorite show is Tots. It's a tiny ones. You know what? Tell me how it goes. Tiny ones, something transport. I can't remember. Anyways, there, there's a name for tots. What it is, it's babies being delivered by the stork to their forever family. And it's always been good. We liked it. It's a nice movie. They are a little cartoon for the kids. And um, This week she was over and I'm sitting there watching it with her. And um, it has always been like, you know, it's animals. Uh, Freddy is a flamingo and Pip is a penguin. And they deliver babies in a cart around the world. You just got to be there. Go home and watch it. You'll like it. The, uh, I'm sitting there, and her and I are eating something, probably something we shouldn't be eating, but we're eating it anyways, and we're watching Tots. And what usually happens is, like, they'll have a baby giraffe, and it's a big the adventure is getting there, and, and they're learning some lesson along the way. And finally, mommy and daddy giraffe, or they find them, they're forever baby, everybody hugs, kisses, things go well, they go back, job well done. And it's always been pretty uh, wholesome. I mean, nothing bad in it. This week, after all of this stuff, I, I'm sure most of us are aware of the stuff going on with Walt Disney and the, the bill down in Florida. Maybe not. The, there's a bill in Florida that restricts gender uh, orientation teaching from K through three. And uh, there's the other side is up in arms over that. They want to be able to teach gender identity all over K through three. Um, and it's coming here too. And uh, that, that um, governor down there wrote a bill against it and he's been under fire since then. Disney went off on him because they're a very liberal comp company. Um, and they vowed, they have special uh, tax status. They govern all their own stuff. They police their own stuff. And when they went against him, he took it away from them. So I have no problem with them, actually, in favor of if you're going to. So I say, let's elect that guy for our next president. Um, but I'm not, I'm trying not to get political, so help me out. Don't cheer me on, because I'll get political. But so Disney now in this thing I watched this week, I was sitting there, we're eating, and they're, they have this baby owl that they're delivering, Pip and, and Freddy are delivering. And, you know, I'm not paying much attention to it until it gets to the end. And instead of being a family of owls, it's two guy wolves that they're delivering an owl to. <laughs> I rewound it, I'm like, are you kidding me? And it's, and it's not mommy and daddy, they didn't say anything big in there but i had to rewatch it because i'm like i'm in spellbound i'm like did i just see what i thought i saw and i go back and look and it's all of this stuff creeping in to our children riley or avery is three years old so are the kids that watch that stuff and i'll tell you one of the things i thought just thought of now is they'll be indoctrinated because we watch the same show over and over and over. If you, anybody had young grandkids, you watch the same show about a hundred times until you can talk them out of, into something different. That's where we're at. So when I say this and I'm talking about back to the sermon, people who have ears, let them hear. There are some people who are not going to hear. God knows who they are. There's some people that can't see and they don't get what is in this word. 
It's not open. God hasn't shut it off to them, but they've turned themselves off to it. They've turned away from it. They want nothing to do. And so God says here, well, if they don't want nothing to do with it, then I'm just going to turn away from them and deal with the people that want me. Now, as I studied with Sproul on, on this video thing that I was watching, it's, on, it's one of the media things that I have, and it's got all these lessons. Um, as I was studying, he says to that, he says, he says it seems harsh. Jesus, it seems kind of hard. And it does mean like he's turning, you know, all right, you guys ain't going to listen to it, then fine. Go. You're done. You're off. And we think that's harsh, but he's got to deal with the people that will deal with it. He knows. And, and there is a battle, whether you want to face it or not, there's a battle between good and evil in this world, a spiritual battle that is at hand. I believe that when he turns away and he says, you know, they can hardly hear with their ears or they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see, and I would turn here. When he does that, he knows that they're not going to turn back. They're going to keep going down this path. In essence, um, that's the hill they choose to die on, so to speak. And God moves away from that. Jesus is talking to us, and he's saying, and, and I often say this after I speak, let those who have ears, let them hear. Not to what I'm saying, but what the Spirit is teaching through the parable or the message that's being given. We come to church to hear what? A message, a sermon. That pastors are, are called by God, anointed by the Holy Spirit to share a message. He takes a passage of Scripture that if you're following God, you believe that God is speaking to you by the Holy Spirit, and you feel led to preach on something. And so you look in here, and actually I look after he gives me a, a, a scripture. I begin to look at it. I begin to pray about it. Then by the end of the week, I start putting scriptures that are going to fit. He gives me points in there. And then on Saturday, I sit down, and I put it all together, hopefully that it makes sense when I say it. But it's a message trying to teach us as people, all of us, because I learned just while I'm getting this revelation that this is what God is saying to us. This is what he wants us to know, wants us to understand. And we must have ears to hear. We must be here desiring God. Because if you're not here desiring God, truly, and I, I say that this sounds kind of harsh coming out of me, if you're not here desiring God, you're wasting your time. It's harsh, but that's why we're here. And it may be a little desire. Maybe you say, well, Pastor, I don't really know that I want to be where you are at, but maybe someday. But, or maybe I'm here questioning God or, or trying to figure out a little bit of something about God. Maybe I'm here wondering if God is real. Those things are all fine. But you're here trying to find answers for God. You're not going to stand up in the crowd and start trying to shout me down because I'm preaching the truth of the word. And uh, it goes against the things that you believe or that you're being taught generally we're here to find god and then we come and we as we find him we come to learn more about him we come to grow in faith and continue to to learn more about his word to become empowered amen i think that's something we miss at times we become empowered with the word of god by the holy spirit we're here not just for us, but once we gather this stuff in and we get a hold of this message, we're supposed to take it out and share it. And I'm going to talk to you about next why and in what ways were the parables um, of Jesus so effective and why do they continue to be so effective? Because they still are effective when you read in the Bible and you see a, a parable and you get the knowledge that comes from it. It can change the course of the direction you're on. It can change your way of thinking about something. There's many of us that have been around here for decades, and our thinking is still being changed as we go. Because we're learning more. Things are being opened to us. We must always come to God with ears that are open to hear. God's laying this on my heart right now. That's part of the reason why the church has gotten soft and mild in this day and age it's because we come to church often church as a whole to hear what we want to hear not what we need to hear we want to hear and i've had people tell me this well 
before. Um, well, I want to feel good when I leave church. Well, I do too. But it doesn't always work like that. I want to know, I feel good about the fact that Jesus still lets me come into church doors without the church blowing up or me getting struck by lightning. That's a good thing. Because there was a day when I first walked through the doors, I'm like, and I got back out that hour later, I'm like, Phew. I don't know how this is going to go. But many times, and I've heard that, something about conviction I, I, that I have learned is when we're convicted by a passage or a scripture, the words of a sermon, I feel good because I feel relief. God has opened this up. This, maybe I don't know what is bothering me. Maybe I don't know what is holding me back, what the enemy is doing to me. But I've come and I heard a message or I, I read the word and I found a parable and now I understand. And even though I don't feel like I'm, uh, you know, tiptoeing down the tulips on my way out the door, I, I, I realize this is what I got to work on to get right in my heart and to move forward. The Bible teaches in Revelation Jesus says about the church of Laodicea, he said, because I wish you, you were either hot or cold. And the church is us, the church is people. I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's a pretty harsh thing that Jesus says. How many churches do we have that are lukewarm? A lot. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be a, a spiritual beat down every time you come into church, but it, it's got to have some truth in it, or it's not worth, if I'm not preaching truth, I, I shouldn't even bother you guys to come to church. I often get this vision of, a, of the churches. We come to Sunday, it's like a football team. And this is the huddle for the game. Kind of what the Lions look like, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> we, we gather together. We call this great plan. We clap. We come out. And we don't run the plan. We just go do something else. We don't have no clue what we just talked about in the huddle. We just say, Stafford, wait till the last two minutes and try to drag us out of this one. But he's not there no more, so that doesn't work. But think about it. That's what we're here on Sunday. We're, we're, we're hearing the plan. We're being inspired to do something with the words. This is not a, a stagnant kingdom or a stagnant faith that we have. It's a growing faith. Because it's got stagnant, the world has taken over. We'll get to that in the parables next week when I begin to teach through those. Why in what ways, point three, were the parables of Jesus so effective? John 14 says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. He's talking about returning to the Father with his disciples, and they're still yet to understand what he's talking about. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know, know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know, excuse me, from now on, you do know and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said, you know, let me wait right there. I just, as we're looking at it, show us the Father, and that will be enough to us. How often do we miss the fact that Jesus and the Father are one? Many times we like to hear in, in, in the world, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe there's something out there. God, the, the big man upstairs, all, you know. Talk to them while you believe in Jesus, and a lot of that's like, whoa. Because when you start believing in Jesus, then you got to believe it's real. When Jesus, the word Jesus uttered, then you think, mm, he came to save people from their sins. That means I'm a sinner. And it's not good enough to just know Jesus came and did something. Now I might have to go and do something. That one was for free. Jesus answered and said, don't you know, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not, this is what I want to do. I think I have it underlined, yes. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me 
who is doing his work. Let's read that again. The words that I say to you, do not, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Why do the parables work so well? Why were they so effective? Why would they open knowledge and understanding? They give us revelation. Why would they back the Pharisees into a corner and cause them to have to deal with their sin and their, their pride and their piousness? Why would uh, these things, why do they have this effect? They're just words. They're not just words. They're empowered by Jesus, by the power of God, the authority of God. Why are they so effective? Jesus is the embodiment of truth. One of the things we hear is, well, that's your truth. My truth is, we hear that. Try to argue, like I said, go back and argue with a liberal, and they'll tell you, well, this, that might be your truth, but this is my truth. Even our truth that we say is our truth is not our truth. The real truth is here. This is what we were founded as a country upon. This is why we are here alive. This is what God gave us. He said, you want to get to heaven? Here's the truth. Here's the way, the map, the road. Jesus is the way, the truth. I write down here, even though it's truth, he says his words are not. So many people think that they can find contradictions in the words of God. And there's times, honestly, there's times where it looks like it's saying something. It never does. The word always holds up itself, always validates itself. It will never contradict. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same person and three entities. Jesus, I often say, it seems as though the Father has the top pecking order because he's always referring back to the Father. Jesus is referring back. The Holy Spirit is the, the consciousness and personhood of both of them coming back and who we have here leading and guiding us. But Jesus speaks with authority. His words are truthful. Truth cuts. Listen to the, the, in the beginning of John. He's speaking about who Jesus is. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the embodiment of the Word of God. God says, put everything that is in this book into his Son, into his heart, in his heart, his mind, his soul. God, Jesus is the Word of God. You want to that's why sometimes I think we say the words that we may be the Bible, the only Bible people ever read. You hear that. Not because it's us, but because it's Jesus living in us. People need to know, they, you need to know the word. But what you really need to know is Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of the word. He's the embodiment of absolute truth. There are people out there that try to um, point out contradictions and things like that. There, there is no contradictions. His words are not subject to skepticism or debate. There's no other meaning in his words than what he has intended for them to carry. You can't look into the... Now, you, you look here, and, and we, we talk about the fact that sometimes Scripture says something different to us now than what it said to us 10, 15, 20 years ago how it's a living and it's active word, but the words that he says that he has put in it, they carry the meaning that he has intended for them to carry. Can they be taken out of context? Yes, they can. I remember years ago listening, I think it was on Bob Ducos, to, uh, he was kind of grilling a pastor that seemed to cherry pick and, and from the words to make things work. And at that time, I could just remember them talking. There were three or four pastors saying, yeah, we preach this stuff, but not this, because this is not real popular. They, cherry, they, they admitted to cherry-picking in the Bible what they would preach. I would be afraid to do that. It would go back to the lightning strike thing. That wouldn't... You cannot... There's no other meaning in his words than what the, he has intended for them to carry. In Isaiah... The, the, the Lord says, my words go forth, and they accomplish what I sent them for. They never return to me void. God, there's a, not only are these words coming from, I didn't finish, I got wound up. Let me finish this scripture. Je, 
John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him, this is important. I didn't put this one up there, but I got it. In him was the life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shined into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let me read that again. In him, Jesus was the life. That life was the light of all mankind. That light is the goodness of mankind. That light is the love that is instilled in us from God. That light is the compassion. That light is the the fruits of the Spirit. That light is what sets us apart. That light is what we're told to, to carry out and to not put under a bushel basket, but to set on a hillside so that all can see it. The goodness, the compassion, the love, the forgiveness of Christ is that light. It was the light of all mankind. That's what makes us who we are as born-again believers. And it says that light shines into the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. Here's a test. I don't know. When I tell you this test, you'll understand what I'm dealing with up here sometimes. In my mind, I think, here's an exercise. Go into your closet. Close your closet down. See how dark it is in there. It's so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face. Light a match. See how that light of that simple match overcomes that darkness in your closet. All right, go in there next. Don't burn anything down at home when you do this, all right? Go in your closet with the match lit. And shut the door and see if that same darkness can overcome the light of that match. Now just let that percolate for a minute. Think about that. That's the power of God's word. The darkness cannot overcome that. He can speak a single word into the darkness of your heart, of our hearts, of their hearts, anybody's heart, into a situation. And the light that is in him, the light of all mankind, can illuminate that. And set us free from that. And when you have that light and that life inside you, if we are following God, the darkness that the enemy wants to bring cannot overshadow that light. Do we understand what the light of Christ is having in there? The light that's supposed to be outside in this nation, it's not overcome by darkness. To light, it, it seems like it is a lot of times because we put the, the basket over it. So people can't see the light. We keep it to ourselves. We're not sharing the light. We're not being the light like we should be. The power of God. Why were the parables so effective? As I watched that video, he said this, and I believe that Jesus was the greatest teacher to ever walk the face of this earth. Think about that for a moment. All the degrees, all the accolades, all the masters, you know, and all that stuff that's out there, Jesus has all of that wisdom in him already. There's not a greater teacher that has ever walked the face of this earth other than Jesus. And he is anointed with a supernatural power from God. Sometimes the word supernatural conjures up things. I don't know how else to explain the power of God to, to you. It's a power that is there. It might be, we can't always see it, often can feel it. You've known over the last couple of weeks when the Spirit is moving and people are coming to the altar in the middle of the service while we're singing. I haven't even preached yet, and they're not. That's the power of God moving. That's the power of God drawing us towards him, towards his love, towards his grace. When we have a high moment, when we see something in Scripture that we've never seen before, we didn't understand, that's the power of God. Think about the power of God. He said in the beginning there, wasn't, there was nothing. He spoke. Like 
came into existence. He spoke in the waters separated, and we got content, continents, not continents, continents. He made animals. He picked up some dust off the ground and said, you know, I don't have anybody. I got everything but a man. Adam was born. Adam says, I'm lonely. I would have said, here's a fish. No. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Adam says, no, God says, I will make a suitor. Someone, he named all the animals. He's given dominion over the earth. And he, God knew that he was lonely and he needed someone. So he put him in a deep sleep, took one of the ribs out and created a woman out of it. That's why when we read, regardless of what they tell you, outside of here, that when you get to Genesis 2, 24, it says a man shall leave his mother and cling to his wife and the two shall become flesh. That's marriage. It doesn't say you take a baby owl and give it to two wolves and that's what you'll be teaching the kids from here on out. Jesus was anointed with the power of God. Still is anointed. I'm just about done. I know Dave had to go, so we're gonna, I'm going to lead a song. No, I'm not going to lead. We're going to close in prayer. God, he's powerful, but I don't know about that. The, uh, no. Here's a cool thing. Jesus went back to heaven. After his resurrection, he sent the, his uh, disciples to back to the, the upper uh, room. He told them to go and wait until they were endued with power from on high after he appears to them. And I think this is something we forget. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe we're afraid of it. I don't know. But we are endued with a power from on high. God, Jesus said when he was walking on earth, he sent the 70 out two by two. And they came back, his disciples, his followers, they came back rejoicing that they could uh, heal broken bones and sickness, receive, give the, 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 the blind back their sight, that they could cast out demons, that they could do all these wonderful things that they had seen him do. He said, I'll tell you the truth. Even greater things than these will you do someday. So how often do we leave that power? We have, and don't get me wrong, I'm not placing us with God. I'm placing that we are commissioned by God. He said, you do my will. You do what I'm asking you to do. I'll give you everything you need. I'll give you the power. I'll anoint you. Your words will go forth because they're my words. And they'll accomplish what I am telling you to accomplish with them, what I'm sending them. You got somebody that's got demons and you need to, they, they don't know what to do. He says, go cast them out. You need healing? When we pray for healing. I always say, if you believe in healing, come up here. If you don't, stand back there and wait. You'll learn and you'll see it and you'll gain faith. Because we have to have, when we do heal, when we pray for healing, we do these things. Got to be people that believe in that. And I'm not saying it's wrong if you say, well, I don't know, Pastor, I've, I've never seen. Th that's fine. We all come and grow. There's a lot of things that I had to grow into in the faith before I could actually feel comfortable preaching or praying or, or talking about them. But I've seen people get healed. I've seen cancer ridden. I've seen just crazy things that it could only be God. And I, and I have faith in that. I've seen him do those things. It, this is what we need. To, these stories, these words, this prayer, this walking with God empowers us to do the same thing that Jesus did while he was here. The problem is too many of us are willing to leave that power, that opportunity on the shelf. Sometimes we think, well, as pastors, it's your job. 
it is my job, and I'm glad it is my job. I love doing what I do. But it's my job is to equip you and let you know you have the power to do this thing. Because you have opportunity to reach people I'll never see. I like it if you bring them to church, but there might be somebody you meet in the highway and byway, and they're just having a problem, you stop and you pray with them. You don't know what that's going to do in their life. Just a simple prayer at times. A simple word to somebody. Sometimes we stay back and we say, well, I don't know if I know what to say. I don't know what to say every week, but I get up here and do this. God gives me the words. I get notes that put me in, uh, uh, keep me in somewhat of an order, and then the Holy Spirit comes and does the work. If you get anything out of these messages, it's not from me, trust me. It's from the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through me, giving me utterance. Let's all stand this I feel empowered to be kind to you this morning and let you out 10 minutes early, maybe. God is good, amen? amen. We're going to be looking at these parables and see what they teach us. It's my prayer that it, that it, it unlocks some of the secrets and the mysteries of God. Jesus says that when he's talking. He says it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now, we may not ever know everything about the kingdom of God. I don't believe we will. I, don't, I think there's questions out there we'll never get answered. We'll just trust in faith and walk in it. But he has said to his disciples, to those whom will follow him, it's been given to you. We are following Jesus, amen? We're supposed to be. That wasn't a very resounding amen. We are following Jesus, amen? amen. He says that the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven were available to them. They're available to us still today. Things will happen in your life when you begin to walk with God that you could have never predicted. I will guarantee you one thing. God, he may do this. I've never had it happen in my life. He will never take you from point A to point B in a completely straight line. He will take you all over the place, teaching you, learning you, and causing you to have faith in him, to go through all these things he's got, to get to where he's taking you. You'll gain more than what you ever thought. And if you truly serve God, and you truly are interested in the power of God, and these things that I'm talking about this morning, you'll never get bored with God. Somebody asked me this, I said, you know, Christianity is like an adventure. You never know. The Holy Spirit comes and says, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he says, uh, well, how do I know it's the Holy Spirit? He says, well, you hear that? He says, yeah, I hear that. What is it? The wind? All right. Do you know where the wind is? Can you see it? No. Do you know where it's coming from? No. Well, how do you know it's there? Because I feel it. That's like that with us, with the Holy Spirit. We don't know when he's coming. He might say, hey, guess what? This morning, this is what we're going to go do. Or you may be in the middle of your day, and he may put somebody in. Hey, go talk to that person. And you do it. You might think, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. But that's okay. You get used to it. I'm used to it. It works out most of the time. It's here for us. Don't leave it on the shelf. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we look into this word, as we, as we begin to open up and study some of these parables, these teachings, that serve as illustrations that sometimes bring us to a point where we understand that there's a sin in our lives that we need to take care of, bring judgment to our mind on our behavior, our character. It's you showing us where we need to be fixed, to surrender to you so that you can work in that area. And I think, Father, the most prolific thing about the parables is the fact that they give us new revelation. They open our hearts and our minds to more of you, to more of your kingdom. They allow us to see things and to hear things that we didn't know before, no matter how long we've walked with you. It, once we quit learning uh, in your word and through your witness in our lives, generally that means we're in heaven. 
because I don't know how we quit learning down here, Father. Lord, I would pray this morning, this is on my heart, I would pray this morning that there might be some that would say, I, I, I don't really know this power. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe there's somebody that has slidden away from the Lord. Maybe there's a struggling in, in, in the place that they're at. Maybe there's some here that don't know who he is yet, haven't made that commitment. And they're, they're sitting here hearing this sermon thinking, man, that Jesus sounds like something in this power to, to forgive and, and to bless and to renew my spirit and my soul. Seems like something I want. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. My words have no magic in them at all. I'm saying that as your preacher, pastor. The word of God has power to save, power to redeem. When you pray to God and you ask him to forgive you, he has the ability to forgive every sin that you've ever committed and forgive the future sins that you will commit if you will commit your heart and your way to him. He has the power to set you free from whatever is holding you back. All it takes is a mustard seed of faith. It's a little bit of faith that would say, I believe in this stuff this preacher's preaching and this word is saying to me this morning. And I want some of that. If that would be you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't like to make you raise your hands or come forward. I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've never asked Christ in your life. Maybe you're re-asking. Maybe you're saying, I need a, a cleansing. I need an invigoration. Just say, Lord, I know I've sinned. And I know I've fallen short of your glory. And the glory that you had intended for me. And I ask that you would forgive my sins. I ask that you would Cast them, as it says, as far as the east from the west, and remember them no more. And I will repent, which means to change the course, direction that I'm on. I will repent from my sins. I will turn, and I will follow you from this day forward. I ask that you would do those things, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would come into my heart into my high mind and live and guide me from that day forward, from this day forward. I believe if you just prayed that prayer, you're a born-again Christian. I believe it with all my heart and soul. Put all my chips in the basket that say, that's what I'm here to tell you this morning. Father, I just listened to that prayer, and I pray now that if there are those who have prayed that prayer, if there are those who are crying out and saying, I, I need to get back, I, I would pray that you would pour out a blessing of your spirit and your power in this place and upon them. I pray that they would feel that and be renewed in that and understand how much you love them. You love them so much, it says, that you sent your one and only son to the cross. That whoever would believe upon the fact that you sent your son to die for them would be saved. Father, I pray that you put in them the hope of heaven, the hope of everlasting life, the hope of the power of the kingdom of God residing within them and them residing within it. Father, I pray as we go from this place now that you would just continue to, to bless our day, bless our time together, bring us together again tonight for the uh, uh, children's or the youth ministry as we come together and just bless our weeks till we get to be here again. Together, I pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. And all God's people said.